thank you for coming. And um, today is the first of three sessions about financial literacy sponsored by the Athenaeum and also with a lot of curriculum from the FDIC's Money Smart. And this is a curriculum that it's based on, but we can obviously be flexible and pivot if there's things you guys want to focus on and talk a little bit more about. And a little background about myself. Uh, my name is Abby De Molina. I am a finance manager at Santander Bank, and I also got involved in financial literacy through the Economic Empowerment Group Forum with the state of Massachusetts. So I've done a, a variety of different financial literacy courses. And um, as I mentioned, they're pretty flexible. We base it on the FDIC curriculum, but there's a lot of information so we can focus on any areas that are important to you. So that's what we're going to do. So if you go to the next slide, that this will outline the five modules that we're going to be focusing on. So the first one is talking about your money values and influences. The second one is talking about banking specifics. The third one is focusing on income and expenses. Fourth one is spending and savings plan. And then the fifth one is about savings. And so that's what we're really focusing on banking, understanding how you're spending money and then what you can do to save today. But next week we're going to talk about credit. And so we'll kind of go from there. But of course, if you have questions, you want to talk about anything different, feel free to let me know. So the first module is really just basics for you of understanding your money values and what influences how you look at money. If you can tab forward. Here we go. So everybody has slightly different values and Bottom line is it's whatever is important to you and helps you decide how you make decisions. And they influence everything in your everyday life, how you spend your time, your energy, your money, and what you want to do. And understanding what your values and what's important to you can help you set achievable financial goals because there's nothing worse than setting a goal and knowing it's unrealistic and then stressing about how you can't meet that goal. So this little scenario here is talking about Valentina and Isaiah, uh, who are lucky enough to get a tax refund. And Valentina, who had put herself through college, working 30 hours a week, she has some student loans. Her mother also is struggling financially. And what Valentina would want to do is give most of the money in the tax refund to to her mother to use as a security deposit so she can move to a new apartment. She wants to use the rest of it to pay down her student loan debt. So that's what's important to her is family and then paying off her debt. Isaiah's parents helped him with his college expenses and um, money they had saved over the year. He doesn't have a ton of loans and he has paid them off already before he even met Valentina. He wants to put most of the money in tax free accounts for the kids that um, they have their three children. So to set them up for the future, if they're going to college and then whatever is left over, he'd like to take the family on a vacation because what's important to me is to him also is family, but spending that quality time together. So this is just an example of there's no right or wrong answer here. This is just what values are most important to them and what helps them kind of shape making their decision. So if you go to the next slide, when we talk about goals and money, um, this kind of depends similar to what your values are. It's really important to understand what your goals are, your desired results, and um, helps you achieve whatever your hopes and dreams are. And Setting goals help you prioritize how you're going to use your money and then also measure and track progress. And it's important to, as I mentioned before, make sure that you set goals that are achievable and that aren't unrealistic so that you set yourself up for failure. So one of the tips that we often use is something called a SMART goal, which means specific, measurable, action-oriented, reachable, 
and time bound. And um, these questions on the right hand side of this table talk a little bit about how you can achieve that with this SMART goal. So making it specific, what exactly do you want to do? Why is it important? Is it something I really want? Sometimes people are doing things based on what other people want, but also taking your own interests and thoughts into account is important. Making sure it's measurable. How much, how many, how will you know? Is it something that's measured in you know, dollars and cents? Is it percentages? Just knowing what helps you understand if you've reached your goal or not. Um, action oriented of what specific actions do you need to complete if say it's a financial goal I want to save $50 a week then the action is the actual saving of the money reachable is again making sure it's something you can actually do if you say well I'm going to save $5,000 a week that might be really difficult so making sure that you pick an amount that is achievable within whatever your budget and expenses are and then the time bound of when I'm going to reach that goal again you know, it doesn't have to be tomorrow. It doesn't have to be this week. You can set yourself up for six months, a year, whatever that target is, and it's really up to you. But again, making sure that it's achievable is an important part because it helps you by being realistic. Now, the next piece is talking about, and this is the tricky part, external influences. So there's a ton of them, advertisements, media, celebrities, peers and friends, and they can be both positive and negative. Sometimes they're productive. They help you achieve your goals. Sometimes they're unproductive. They can get in the way or distract you. Um, social pressure in advertising is especially difficult because there's a lot of wanting to keep up with the Joneses. Advertisers spend a lot of money to influence how people spend their money. And impulse purchases definitely can make it harder for people to achieve goals because you might have money set aside, but if you make an impulse purchase, you're kind of going to have to start over. So that being said, these are a lot of things that can throw roadblocks your way. So there are a couple of strategies you can use to stay focused. One is recognizing the tactics used by advertisers. I know when I think about this, if you think about, say, food, recognizing that the food that they're showing you on TV isn't necessarily the food that you're going to get if you go to this place or that showing a certain kind of lifestyle if you buy something that's not necessarily going to happen. So making sure that you understand and you're aware of that will definitely help you. Also along the lines of this awareness, noticing when and where you're tempted. So maybe you know that if you go by a certain type of store that you're gonna to wanna to go in and browse. So maybe making sure that you do a route that avoids that place or knowing that if you go like if you have your amazon browser always open that you're going to jump in and you know just just look to see what the deals are so making sure that you're aware of things that will tempt you and then um making sure you kind of control your environment as i said trying to to find ways to avoid that an important tool that can be used is just building in a pause so if there's a purchase you really want to do and you're thinking about it impulsively Maybe sit on it. A lot of times people say sleep on it and then think about it the next day or week. And if it's still something you feel strongly about and that you can afford, then maybe you go for it. But if you forget about it, you think about it the next day, then you know that you made the right choice and not necessarily diving in and getting whatever that thing is. And um, so if you can talk yourself out of it. I know that's easier said than done. Um, and Something that can be difficult but also helpful is calculate in hours or days what an item is worth. If you think about it, your hourly wage, divide the coffee item, then you can quantify it in terms of like how how important is this for my time. And so you could equiv you can equate something to say, you know, this is going to take me a hundred hours to do or whatever that type of thing is. So Again, these are just some of the, the tips of how you can um, work through that. Now, the second module, I, as I mentioned, is talking about banking. So this is giving you an overview of the different product services providers. Um, the two big places, obviously, that you can bank are with banks, but also credit unions. Um, they're similar, but there are some differences. 
they offer, they obviously accept deposits of money, they lend money, they might have other things. A lot of banks and credit unions have car loans, credit cards, mortgages, personal loans, lines of credit, all sorts of things as well. And so the difference between banks and credit unions is banks have customers, whereas credit unions have members. And part of that is if you're in a credit union, you, there might be some sort of membership criteria. You may need to belong to a certain type of organization. If you're in a union, they have credit unions. If you're a veteran, there, there's all sorts of different credit unions based on um, those types of membership organizations. And there are not-for-profit organizations that are owned by the members. So this is very different from a bank in that most banks are owned by shareholders. But the good news is for both, there is some sort of insurance, as I mentioned before, the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, they protect funds from depositors because they are federally insured in case the bank fails. A lot of people don't necessarily think about this, but this was something that came up during the 2008 crisis. So it is something to think about. And these deposits are insured up to at least 250,000 per depositor or bank or category. And similarly in credit unions, it's not the FDIC, but it's called the National Credit Union Administration. And it's similar in place for federally insured credit unions and it's very similar to the FDIC. So the important thing is if you think about this, whereas I'll go into this a little later, but when you're thinking about ways to put your money aside, it is something to just consider that you would be able, if something terrible happened, you still would be able to recoup some of your funds. Whereas if you're using a different vehicle, let's say you invested the money, you might not be able to get that money back. So it is just something to think about and keep in mind when trying to figure out what you want to do with your money. So the different types of products, there are deposit products, I mentioned checking accounts, savings accounts, certificates of deposit, there's money market accounts, uh, credit products are lines of credit, credit cards, some types of installment loans, personal loans, mortgages, and then there's a couple of other products and services. And these on the right-hand side are some of those things that you can find at a bank, ATMs, cards, um, prepaid cards, mobile banking or online banking, bill pay, uh, debit cards, person-to-person -person payment, P2P, um, cashier checks, rem remitted transfers, uh, check cashing, a bunch of these different activities are what you can do at a bank in addition to obviously going and getting your money and um, going through credit. I, Abby, I have a quick question. Could you give yes, me an overview, like a, just like for dummies explanation of what money market accounts are? Sure. So money market accounts are usually they have a specific, they're time bound but it's a way for you to invest. So a lot of banks have them. And so what's different than say a savings account is, let's say your rate on an, a savings account might be like 2%. You might be able to find a money market account that is say 4%, but you have to leave the money there for six months. And it depends on the different types of like money market, but they usually have a certain amount of time in which you have to leave the money there. And so you'll get a slightly higher rate of interest, but the kind of catch is, but then you can't access that money. So it's not very liquid. Does that make sense? It does. And then how does that differ from a, a CD? So that is similar to CD. I think though the difference is if a CD is in a certain, let's say account, with a money market, you can sometimes go back and forth between your accounts that you have with a certain organization. So an example at Santander, if I have a money market, I could potentially move money between my checking and my money market, but a CD, you can't move it anywhere. So they're just, they're like more restrictive, but they have higher interest rates. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? And thank you for asking a question. 
Okay. So, um, continuing on. So, obviously, the basics of opening an account. Um, I talked about the different kinds of accounts, savings and checking accounts. They're safe because of the FDIC insurance. You earn interest depending on the account. Um, they're convenient. You can build the relationship with the organization. And there's a lot of, and this has really developed over time. I've been in finance for um, 15 years, but there's a lot more consumer protections today than there were even, say, 15 years ago. And a lot of that was related to the, um, the crisis in the early 2000s. But there are a lot more consumer protections, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit. But um, when you want to open an account, obviously you can do it in person, but now you can do it online. You can decide whether to opt in. That's for um, any sort of marketing. This is one of the areas where there's a lot more protection, where people are not marketed to unless they're opting into that. There's a lot more um, disclosures, documents, different account tools, all of those things are available. Um, the important thing is, of course, you have to verify who you say you are. There are, again, more sophisticated tools today, ways for them to check IDs, things like that. Um, with your banking history, they do run a credit report, so not everybody is always approved for an account, but they, um, they include information, like if you have negative balances in other accounts, if there's been fraud, if a bank has closed an account on you. And um, it's important for every consumer to know you have the right to one free banking history report each, each year from every, um, every, there's three re consumer reporting agencies and you have the right to have one from each of them. And um, there are, I threw this in here, this link consumerfinance.gov. If you wanted to write a letter or you have to dispute, sometimes there's inaccurate information I know um, people who might have similar names or someone has a similar social security, things like that. You can run into that where other people's information ends up on your credit report. So you have to dispute that. And um, I just did this here as a little sample. Like if you're doing check systems, you go to the website and you dispute. And as I said, if you use this link, they have sample letters. So you can go and download the letter and then just fill in your information. And it's important that you do check and make sure everything is accurate because you don't want to get dinged and you also don't want to have information that you don't even know about dragging down your credit. So this is really important. And I'll talk a little bit more about that next week, but um, does anybody have any questions about your banking history? Okay. Continuing on. Um, so these are a bunch of different challenges that you can run into for um, when you're opening an account. One might be that you don't have an, enough money or account fees are too high. There are some accounts that they charge like a monthly fee or they have different types of balance requirements, things like that. So one of the things is with that option, it's always important to consider there is usually a low cost option available because of consumer protection. So even if there is a great account that is $50 a month, there usually is a more affordable account. And if you're not sure, you can always ask. And um, again, in this situation, if there's a negative information, any sort of negative information on your history report, there are um, the different products available for second chance. And again, it's a really important to ask because a lot of times people don't realize that um, banks do understand and they will work with you to see if there's some sort of product that they can fit you in with. And similar to this on um, negative information, your credit report or low credit scores, a lot of banks have secure credit cards, they have counseling, you can get a credit building loan. Like there are a lot of different opportunities and ways for you to work slowly to improve your credit. Um, no social security number. Again, there are other documents you can use. You can get an account um, without a social security number. And um, 
again, if you can't open a certain account, you can always use a prepaid card, which I'll talk about a little later, but that is an option as well. So when managing your account, very important, read all the rules, make sure you keep track of everything, review your statements. Nowadays, it's really great. You can set up email or text alerts. I know this has been, for me, really helpful. I actually went abroad earlier this year and then someone started using my account information. But since I had text alerts immediately, uh, they were texting, is this an activity you're doing? And you can just text back, no, and then it's pretty quick. But it's also a really good way for you to make sure, rather than you having to wait to find out back in the day when you have to wait to get mailed your statement, it's a lot quicker. So then you can discover the fraud sooner and then have it resolved faster. So having email or text alerts is great. Keeping track of any holds on your card and protecting your card. Um, another way for you to avoid, especially we're going to talk about overdrafting, you can link your checking account to your savings account or line of credit. And then just staying safe online. I know it sounds obvious, but making sure you don't click weird links, don't forward weird emails, things like that. Um, it's very easy to get tracked. So just being safe and aware of your activity is really important. And um, anyway, talking about building it with a savings account, you can build savings by putting the money in earning interest. It helps you for the future. It usually has a higher interest rate than a checking account, but it's not designed for a high number of transactions. Checking accounts, on the other hand, are for frequent use of multiple transactions. You can deposit, pay bills, make purchases, get cash. Um, ATM cards and debit cards, just so people know they aren't the same thing. An ATM card is only for use at an ATM. It doesn't have the, um, the MasterCard or Visa logo with it. And um, it does take money out of your account, but it has to be done through that, whereas a debit card can be used as a, almost as a credit card at a purchase of sale, any, any place you can plug it in with your chip. So just important to, to keep aware they're not exactly the same thing. And then your checks. Um, some checking accounts don't even use checks. I know they definitely aren't as common as they used to be, but people still do use them. They are helpful in a pinch. I know I always have at least one in my wallet, so it's important to just have one. But it's basically just a way for you to pay somebody else. And I have a sample check over here on the right-hand side. This is just basic, so you know everything that's in it. Um, sometimes people don't know at the bottom that 10 and 11 is the routing number in, in your account number and then 12 is the number of the check. But just whenever doing a check, the more details, the better. I know sometimes what's frustrating with checks is sometimes people take a long time to cash them. So that's, again, important for you to be keeping track of your transactions so you see what's coming in and out of your account. But also the more specific you are, then you'll know, oh, okay, this is what that $50 is for. Because if you just wrote like to cash, then it might be harder for you to keep track of it. Um, earlier, I mentioned overdrafts. This is important. It's when a transaction goes through, there's not enough money to cover it. There are different programs to cover overdrafts for ATM and debit card transactions. You have an opt-in, which is um, certain transactions can be processed, but there's usually a fee. Or if you don't opt-in, your card will just be declined. And usually financial institutions will decide whether they cover checks and other payments that would cause the overdraft. If it's covered, you'll be charged an overdraft fee. If it's not covered, then you'll be charged a non-sufficient funds fee, which is NSF fee, and a return check fee. And those are usually at least $35. So what ends up happening is it can definitely add up. And so in this example, there's $50 in a checking account with opt-in. There's the birthday cake, the cash, the gas, and then the phone bill. And then 
there's one or two overdraft charges of $35. So even though this person only went over where um, they went over, let's say, $25, there's charge almost $70. So it's, it's really tough. And then this part where it talks about the order of transactions, each bank will order transactions in a different way. And so again, when you have the specifics of your account, it's important to know like how your bank orders transactions. Sometimes they do them time-based, sometimes they do them based on certain types of transactions. Every bank's a little different. You can find the information, but it's not always super easy to locate. And um, so managing an account, some of the other things you can do, direct deposit, obviously you can just have the money de deposited directly and securely into your account. You don't have to do it in person. A lot of employers offer it for paychecks. And then what is a great also opportunity if you can do this is you can directly default part of your, you can use multiple accounts. So you can say, okay, I want my bank account to go into this checking account, but I want $50 a week to go into this other account. And so if you do it automatically, a lot of times that's a, a good tool where that you don't get caught wanting the $50 because you don't even see it because it goes straight into the, the uh, savings account. And then another helpful tool is automatic bill payment. It just schedules and sends your payments through your bank for one time or recurring payments. This is really great for um, utility bills, cell phones, things like that, where it's always going to be at the same time. And this way you kind of set it and forget it so that you make sure you don't miss a payment. And a lot of times, again, if you have alerts, it's all tied in together and it'll alert you to let you know, hey, I'm going to be making this payment. So you know that um, this payment's coming up and then you can double check your balance and that you have enough. And with automatic debit, this is when you're giving permission to a, um, any merchant or a lender to take payments from your account. For this, you, you usually have to make sure you have enough money to cover these payments. And those might be, again, could be regular payments or just could be one time. And as I mentioned earlier, ATM cards use an ATM for different transactions and the money comes out of your um, financial institution. There are different um, accessibility features. And since it's more limited, it keeps safety in mind because you really can't spend money that you don't have with an ATM card because you're really limited to everything that's just in your account. Um, debit cards, as I mentioned, they look like credit cards that they have logo on them, but they're not. Um, they can be processed on a credit network, but it's not using actual credit and the money's taking out of your account. Um, these last two, I wanted to talk a little bit about mobile wallet apps. There's a couple of different ones. They can make, you can make point of sale purchases with your mobile device instead of a card. This can be tools such as Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Google Pay. So these are a couple of those different wallet apps. Um, they keep your device and your information secure because it's encrypted. And so it is something to keep in mind. But it also, if you're going to be doing that, again, just making sure that you're keeping track of the transactions that you're doing with this type of app. And then P2P payments are when you are transferring money directly to another person. It helps with everyday transactions. This example, paying babysitter, lunch. Um, it also helps with small merchants. And so this could be Venmo, Zelle, those different types of apps. Each one's a little different, but um, I know PayPal, those are, they're really popular and they're also a good way if you have a small business and you don't necessarily want to have the credit card transaction piece, this is a way that you can do that is with P2P payments. And they're, they're a little more popular in other parts of the world than the US, but we're catching on. So I mentioned earlier a little bit about prepaid cards. They allow you to spend or access money that's loaded onto them. They're not really linked to any account. Before you use it, of course, you have to review the futures and fees. So what you can do is you can load money. You can do it in person, your phone, online, through an app. You can use direct deposit. 
you have to register the card to use all the features. There's all kinds of them. There's reloadable payroll cards, EBT cards, there's college or university ID cards, and then prepaid cards for specific stores or public transportation. So um, this little table over here talks a little bit about the difference for reloadable versus debit card. Obviously a reloadable is not linked to a specific bank. And this is an option if you're like for right now, maybe you move, maybe you don't have all your documentation together. It's a good way for you to have access and track your money and make sure that you're not necessarily keeping cash around, but you can't necessarily open a bank account right away. Um, it can still be insured by the FDIC, if, depending on certain conditions, whereas normally a debit card, no matter what will be, um, it uses the money that is only loaded onto the card. Again, both of these are safer than carrying cash. And um, with the prepaid, again, it's a good way if maybe you have spending problems, it's a good way to limit because you really can't spend any more than what's loaded onto a card. But as I noted before, if you, depending on if you're opted into overdraft with a debit card, you can potentially spend more. So prepaid cards do have good uses depending on um, what you're doing. So just food for thought. So the next module is talking a little bit about your income and expenses. And so income obviously is the money that you make and there's different types. There's earned income, income from assets or investments or then public benefits or entitled. Entitlements that pay money, other benefits, other entitlements and other income. And so um, your gross income is just the total income without any deductions, and then your net income is obviously your gross income minus your deductions. So that's what you actually have to save, share, and spend, and it's your take-home pay. And so a little thing here, gross income minus deductions equals net income. Um, something that comes up and can affect your income is a garnishment. That can be a wage garnishment, account garnishment, or a treasury offset. For, um, sometimes if someone, if you, no matter where you work, the government, once you are using your social security number, they'll know. And so if you don't say pay your taxes, they can garnish your wages and take part of your pay away to pay off that debt that you owe them first. So it's important to just be aware that that's what a garnishment is and that often if it happens, the place that you're working, they don't really have any control over it because they are obligated to pay Social Security and FICA and different kinds of taxes. And then the garnishments as well come under that. Anyway, um, there were different ways to, to receive income, obviously cash, paper check, direct deposit, payroll card, or EBT. It, this day and age, I would say that it's less common to be using cash as it was before, especially during the crisis. Some people aren't as comfortable using cash as it used to be. But um, then again, there are some businesses that because of different fees, they prefer either cash or um, certain kinds of electronic payments as well. So um, important thing with your income is understanding your, your pay statement, the kind of information you need, your personal information, the pay period, pay date, as I said, your gross pay, what your deductions, your net pay, and then any employer contributions. And so employer contributions can be if your employer has a 401k program and they match, they can contribute um, sometimes for people's insurance, they contribute to that. So um, just different pieces that they might be contributing to, um, to your income. And then I just mentioned a minute ago, required deductions are FICA, Social Security, Medicare, and of course, taxes. And then there are a bunch of elective voluntary deductions, and those are insurance, dues, retirement accounts, charitable contributions, direct deposits. Um, depending on where you work, some companies allow you to do the charitable contribution directly from your um, paycheck. You don't have to, but it is an option if you know you want to um, donate a certain amount of money. And then um, with income tax withholding, 
it's from the um, IRS, it's form it's your W-4, possibly state and local in income tax forms too. The important, important part of this, as I bolded, is be careful to make sure you don't have too little withheld, because you can see in this little graphic, if you withhold more, it lowers your take home pay. So consequently, if you reduce your withholding, your pay goes up. But what you don't wanna do is withhold too little and then what ends up is you owe a lot of money in taxes because you didn't pay enough during the year. Because the true goal when during tax time is you want to have zero in that you don't owe anything and you're not getting anything back. A lot of people like to get the money back because it seems like free money. But what that really means is that you've given the government a free loan of your money for the whole year where you could have been saving it and earning your own interest on it. Um, again, with income, also important to continue, consider if you have another job or ho hobby, understand how you're being paid, make sure that you pay taxes on that, and then put aside money aside for the future, and then again, keep accurate records. I cannot stress that enough. I know it's hard to do, but again, there's a lot of great free tools out there. If anyone has any questions, wants to know, there's tons of really good apps all sorts of different tools that can help you if you want to um, track your income, track your expenses, any of that stuff. There's a lot of great stuff out there. So happy to provide advice if you need it. And then as I said, by tracking your income, there's a bunch of different pieces, the seasonal stuff, the regular, the one time, and then the unpredictable. So there's a lot of different parts and making sure you do track them all is important. On the other hand, um, expenses, what you can say, save, share, and spend. Uh, important things are the needs, what you must have to live, and then the wants, the things that you desire and can live without, and then obligations are debts that you owe. And then the important questions kind of ask yourself is, are there less expensive ways to meet your needs, or can you use less money for wants, and then can you negotiate lower payments for obligation. And um, important thing is if you receive um, public benefits, just make sure that you're aware of resource and asset limits. And again, monitor how your spending affects the accountable assets because you should use your income in a way to avoid exceeding asset limits. An example of this is um, my mother worked for 40 plus years in affordable housing. In a lot of affordable housing, if people have it, it's based on certain income limits. So you would just need to make sure that you're not exceeding that because sometimes you'll kind of age out of a program. Whereas um, if you manage your income properly, then you would be able to stay within those, those limits. Um, also, obviously, managing your expenses helps you avoid late fees, interest, um, unpaid balances, anything negative on your credit, negative on your credit report, um, any loss of services, and then additional charges associated. And um, ways to pay your bills, obviously, in person, by mail, electronically. You can do it through your bank, credit card website, through the uh, directly to whoever you owe the money to, or bill pay service, and then course via mobile app. And um, as I mentioned, tracking your expenses helps you understand um, how you're using your money, keeping you aware. I think it helps you see where you might be able to make changes if there's any opportunities. And obviously, it can help you spend less because you're um, looking at it more, where it's not kind of out of sight, out of mind, if you will. And um, if you look at this little table here. This is an example of a way that you can track your expenses, see what the expense is. And then if you make sure to categorize it, what you could do is if you're going through this on the, um, you can do it daily, weekly, whatever, but then you can really keep an eye on what are all the things that are needs, what are the things that I want. And then you can even set budgets for each of those categories and see, you know, am I exceeding on my wants? 
Am I exceeding on my needs? Where is the opportunity to, um, to work within those different areas? I'm going to pause for a second. Are there any questions? Okay. No. Okay, that's fine. Just if you had any, feel free to let me know. Um, this next module is talking more specifically about your saving and spending plan. So, of course, the important. Oh. Sorry, I got confused. Uh, hold on. That's okay. There we go. That's right, right? Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So um, the important part is obviously it's the um, it's going to help you keep track of everything if you make a saving and spending plan. That way you can see what you're doing. You compare the income and expenses we just talked about. You understand where your money is going, but then you can also make adjustments um, when filling one out. You can put three sections where you talk about what your net income is in your expenses and then you do a straight comparison and what you see is if it's zero it means your income equals your expenses if it's positive it means you make more than you spend and then if it's negative then you're obviously spending more than you make so even if that happens the important thing is that you actually took the time to do it and understand that because sometimes people don't do this until it's way too late so even if it's daunting, um, it's important to do. And then it's also really important to kind of start small. And so um, in this example, it's saying you can do for the past month, you can start for the past month and see what was my income, what were all my expenses, and then just do that comparison. And then you can plan it for the next month and then kind of see how you're doing. And again, it's okay, nobody's perfect. and. If you're just starting out, you might have a couple bumps, but again, the important part is that you're kind of taking the steps to do it, which is really helpful. So start small and also don't beat yourself up over it because the important thing is that you're trying. So step one. Um, with, um, as I mentioned, with this plan, you can do a different, bunch of different ways you can do it daily, recording your savings, sharing, and collecting your change. Um, that, again, is dependent on you getting a lot of change. The weekly idea, um, a lot of people like this, it's what is called the uh, envelope system, where what you do is you set aside envelopes of all the money for everything you need to pay for that week, and then you do that kind of check-in. And so you might say like, oh, I have these bills this week. I have my cell phone. I have my groceries. I have this. And you kind of like take all, if you want to do it with cash, you can take all the cash out and then just set all those pieces aside. And then you check in, you see like, and you would also theoretically have an envelope for savings and see if you end up having any money left. Um, this is a, this is a very visual system and also is very cash based so it doesn't work for everybody but it does help some people because it's very controllable in that like you see where your cash is where the money is directly going for um, the monthly ideas you can do a monthly review you can have a goal setting session you can um, celebrate successes and prepare for taxes and um, I don't know if anybody has any other ideas these are just a couple that are here, but um, it really depends on what works for you. As I said, you don't want to set anything too daunting. So if you start just daily and kind of go from there, maybe that's helpful. Maybe that's too much and you feel overwhelmed. So you just want to do weekly and, and kind of check in. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's really what works best for you. So, um, so again, with the making your spending and saving plan, there's really only two ways about it. So you can either increase income or decrease expenses. So with increasing income, there are ways you can help cover expenses, saving or share. You can um, sell something, do garage sales, do a part-time job or do workforce development. I know here on Nantucket, there's very robust um, community for selling all sorts of stuff. 
So that is an opportunity. I know people do it through, you can do it through a couple of different organizations. You can do it online through Facebook, a bunch of different groups. But that is something that is an opportunity. If you have stuff that you don't use, you can always sell it and um, come up with some cash. On the other side, what you can do is think about um, decreasing your expenses, conservation, is there anything you can get cheaper or use less of, adjust, is there anything you can renegotiate, certain types of pay payments, and then anything you could do without, what can you eliminate? Um, an example could be if somebody used to have a, like a gym membership, but then you decide maybe I'll just work out from home. So you're not necessarily not working out, you're just not spending that, different things like that. I know um, I had a friend who said they one time went through their phone and looked at their recurring charges and they realized they had over $100 in, you know, Apple Music, Amazon, um, Audible, a bunch of these services that just kind of re-up. And each of them were small, maybe like seven or eight bucks, but it all kind of adds up. So it's important to keep in mind that, you know, there might be some stuff that you can do without that you don't even realize that you have. So, um, so what to do when money is short? And first of all, it does happen. Even the most careful planners, it can happen. Um, what you can do, again, you can increase your income, you can decrease expenses. Another thing that people don't realize, you can contact your creditors, reach out for help and prioritize what to pay first. Um, a lot of times creditors will be willing to work with you, especially if you're proactive and explain the situation. But also you have to realize that if you're going to default on a payment, they would much rather get a partial payment than nothing at all. So they really will be willing to work with you if um, if you realize something's going to happen. So it never hurts to ask and at least just talk to them and kind of reach out and, and find out what um, they might be able to do with you. In that situation, again, um, you have to prioritize based on what might happen, make choices of what to pay in full, what you can pay partially, what pay late. You can You should definitely keep in mind what consequences what can keep you from earning money, anything that will jeopardize your shelter or, or impact your health or um, result in your loss of assets. Just make sure you keep all this in mind. And again, reach out for help. There's a lot of free resources and people who can help you, but a lot of times people don't know unless you ask. So always ask. And the worst that can happen is if you ask, the person says no or they can't help you, but you always might have a chance to um, to find some sort of solution. So the last module, number five, is your savings. So what is saving? Important thing is to set some money aside every time you get income. Regularly saving money, even if a small amount, can make a big difference over time. Um, one of the questions is spending less money the same as saving money? Uh, no, unless <laughs> You only save what you didn't spend. Saving is really setting aside money today for the future. And to build savings, obviously, you have to spend less money and then put some or all of it, as what you put aside into savings. And so important reasons why, obviously, you might have goals, you want to build wealth, you might have emergencies, you might know, um, depending on what kind of job you have, there might be times when you have less income or more expenses. And if you have savings, then you won't be in this dire straits. Obviously, it can give you peace of mind. It can help you get and keep a job. And there's a variety of other reasons, but the general rule of thumb is there's no bad reason to save. It's always going to help you. So it's, wor it's a worthy cause, if you will. Abby, I have another question. Um, sure. Yeah. I, I remember hearing at one point the standard, like the kind of golden rule for savings is to have six months of expenses in liquid assets, like cash and savings account. What, um, what is the standard or what do people recommend for having savings? So that's a great question. And um, it definitely depends. But I do think that six, 
six months is a great target. I do recognize that's really tough, but it's always a great target because especially like if we think of the current situation, even if let's say someone lost their job in March, they might be going back to work by September, but I don't think if you had only set aside, say, two months worth of savings, you would have been properly set up, right? And so six months is great, but it's also tough, too, because that's a lot of money to set aside. And you also brought up a good point that and it's not just setting that aside that money, but making sure that it's liquid or available. I think that's tough too, because if people just see the money sitting there, they'll be like, well, what do I do? I could just use that to do something else. But six months is a really good goal. I'm also in a little bit, I'm going to talk about the rule of 72. So stay tuned for that piece. But um, I, again, there's no wrong answer, but the more is better. So um, here, where, where you build your savings, this is where I talked about there's a lot of different opportunities. You can put it with home, friend or family, a prepaid card, rotating savings or credit association or savings account. And this little table just kind of walks you through. Um, if it's at home, there's no fees, no rules, it's easy to access. Um, but of course, it can be lost or stolen. It can be destroyed in fire, flood or other. Friends or family, again, no fees, no costs but it may keep you from spending the money, but uh, again, can be stolen, can be destroyed. And also I would say definitely can strain a relationship with someone. So I wouldn't recommend either of the first two, just because I think there are better options out there. Um, with prepaid card, again, it's easy to get, it's safer, it's convenient. Um, you can, even direct deposit. There are some fees. There can be theft or loss. So you have to look at your card agreement. It may not have insurance and um, it might not be as easy to move the money into savings. And again, some of these cards have expiration dates. So prepaid card isn't great, but it is an option. And with the rotating savings or credit association, you have to commit to the group to, you have to save on a schedule. You can't easily access the money and but you can get a lump sum of money at a certain known time again you can still get it stolen depending on where the funds are it might not be insured the uh, group members might not make the deposits are required and the group might become too large so it's an option then the last one is of course the savings account it it's insured you can do direct deposit you can obviously move money directly from checking and savings or linked. It's going to earn interest. It's with a bank. It's easy access. Um, there may be fees. It's not always the best option for saving with a really long-term goal because you can probably, you can get higher interest rates and um, depending on the financial institution, it may be harder to access. You may be limited on the number of withdrawals. So these are just a couple of different tools that you can use. Again, everything has advantage or disadvantage. So just when saving, keep it in mind. And um, to your point on the question, also thinking about like access, how, how much do you need to access? Like when we were talking about CDs and money market, those different accounts versus a savings account, like which which ones are easiest to get at. Um, as I mentioned before, the deposit insurance. Um, and then here, where to build your savings. This is a really good example showing you what happens if you put in your mattress versus a bank account. So um, this is just under your mattress, no interest. And it's not, assuming it's not stolen. So in five years, you have $1,000. In 10 years, you're gonna have $1,000. If you put it in a bank account, which pays 2% interest and is compounded monthly, in five years, you'll have $1,105.08, but then in 10 years, you'll have $1,221.10. So obviously you can see 
you're making money over a hundred dollars every five years. So for, for you, like, that's just great to think about of, well, people be like, well, it's just safer for me to have the cash. It's like, yes, but if you do put it with some organization, it's also going to grow and you're going to make money on your money and you're still going to have access to it. So just something to food for thought. And again, this example of showing interest in co combined with um, $5 per month at $5 per month. So again, after year one, you've made 55 cents, $15 after year five, and um, $63 after 10 years, but you've made over $600 in 30 years. And again, this is a super small amount. This is $5 a month. So that's just showing you this example of a really nominal amount of money. $5 is like one day of coffee and that's all you're setting aside. $5 a month for 12 months and you can make a lot of money over a long amount of time. So just something to keep about, keep in mind and think about of looking at this example. Um, talking about APY, annual percentage yield, it reflects the amount of interest earned on a yearly basis. It's different from the interest rate because it includes the effects of compounding. The more often your money compounds, the higher the APY is and the more interest you earn. So when you're looking at different offers, let's say you're looking online, make sure that you look at APYs as opposed to interest rates because there's a lot of fine print, but it shows, it's making sure you're comparing apple to apple. And um, I mentioned this earlier, talking about the rule of 72. This talks about how long it'll take your money to double in value, to divide 72 by the interest rate. The result is an estimated amount of years to double the money, assuming there's no change in rate. So I have two examples here, um, and also no deposits or withdrawals. $50 in a savings account with a 2% interest rate means 36. So 36 years for that $50 to double. The second part is kind of backing into it. What interest rate would require if you wanted to double your money in 10 years? So you take 72 divided by 10 and you get 7.2%. So this is, again, just helping you understand if you're looking to double your money, like how fast your money grows, understanding compounding interest. It's just really important. It's just a helpful thing to kind of keep in, keep in mind when thinking about money and setting aside money because, again, um, if you had set aside your savings and you're not touching them, also that money can be growing. So just something to think about. Food for thought. So another part, important part of this module, as you talked about, um, saving for unexpected expenses and um, important part of the foundation for financial health Setting aside um, any amount of money can cover many unexpected expenses. Why, ha why do it? Obviously life happens, unexpected things happen. If, um, why you should have a goal, it's just that way, if you've already saved, you can avoid creating debt. It takes time and commitment, but it's worth doing and it's important for your financial health. And when you're anticipating changes to your income or expenses, um, it just helps you be ready for that. I know an example of one that I forgot about was my excise tax just came the other day. And I was like, oh yeah, that thing. And so those are some of those bills that arrive only once once a year. And then it's like, oh yeah, you have to pay that. So just making sure that you have money set aside for that kind of stuff is really helpful. Um, and then saving for your goals, creating a plan to save money as I talked about a little earlier, it's your hopes and dreams. What do you want to do? Is there anything your family wants to do? You can go back to your SMART goals that we talked about, setting aside those specific measurable action-oriented reachable time-bound goals. And then the best, one of the best ways to achieve your goals, which seems silly but does work, is writing them down or posting them and share them, but making sure that you have them out there 
so that they're present not only physically but also in your mind because you keep thinking about it. And um, how much money you should set set aside depends on like what you're saving for, how much it'll cost, what you think, what's your deadline. And um, I do talk about large expenses. Many goals are related to large expenses like a car or a house and they obviously require a lot more money than you have left over in a couple of paychecks. Um, and the money needed is usually divided by the time to save. For example, an emergency savings fund of $1,000 in three in two years would be, um, in this example, you divide it by 150 weeks times two years, it's $10 a week. After two years, you'd have $1,040. So, that's just important because again, I think a lot of times people feel like it's really daunting, but if you think about that, if you just save $10 a week, again, that's one or two coffees. And you do that for two years, you're gonna have $1,000. That's pretty impressive considering that's not a ton of money, but if you just commit to doing it, you can really have something set aside and that is manageable. So just, something to think about when you feel like it's overwhelming or too difficult, that you can always start small and you'll still have something. Um, and then this last module, I don't know how helpful this is, but it's just a little bit of information talking about saving and public benefits. And there are some public benefits that again can be reduced or removed if you exceed income or asset limit, limit but there's special accounts that enable people to save more money without losing eligibility for their benefits. So um, this table over here is just talking about some of the benefits and what the asset limits were. Um, on the right hand side, this is one of the benefits, it's called an ABLE account and they're for um, individuals with disabilities and um, they can be used to save money without lo lo losing eligibility for supplemental security income, Medicaid, or any other benefits. And um, what you can use with these, these expenses, a bunch of these different um, pieces over here on the right-hand side, education, employment, technology, healthcare, um, any other expenses. Um, other public benefits that also come up here, I think it's on the next page. Um, a special needs trust, it's to fund long-term expenses for somebody with a disability. It can be complicated, you might need an attorney. A pooled one, it's the same benefits as a special needs trust, but it might cost le less, but it has one entity that manages that account. And there's usually a corporation that manages it, a nonprofit. Um, a plan to achieve self-support is to set aside money for items or services to achieve a specific educational work goal. And um, again, this is a list of like supplies, school expenses, different types of things. And then um, match savings accounts encourage saving money for a specific pur purpose. And again, they're um, run by usually local community-based organizations and they're usually matched by the organization running the program. So. Um, this example is individual development accounts or children's savings accounts. And um, these are allowed, there are different allowable purposes, training, education, purchasing a home. And the important thing is if you're getting some other public benefits, they usually don't count against the benefits if it's federally funded or part of a path. So, and that's it. So I don't know if anybody has any other questions. Do you have a little bit of time? Happy to answer anything. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes I can. Yeah. Um, I, I do have some questions, but I think you're going to probably cover things next week. They're about credit scores and maybe closing a bank account, would it affect your credit score? I mean, they're probably very basic things you should know, but I don't know. And 
I feel like I need to know. So maybe I'm kind of jumping ahead here. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, we will talk a lot about that next week, so you should um, tune in. But generally, I would say um, when you do open or close an account, it does show up on your credit. So I would say sometimes a good kind of tip is if you're not using an account is not to necessarily close it, but just make sure that the balance is zero and you're not getting charged any fees. So the only thing is sometimes like let's say you have a credit card and you're not using it, but they charge like an annual fee, just making sure that you're aware of that. But for instance, mm -hmm. it does, benefit your credit if you have a bank account, like a long standing relationship with some organization. So that's why, let's say sometimes people like to do this where they might like open five credit cards and then they use them and then they close them down. That might adversely affect your credit card credit score. Whereas you could, if you have a credit card, like I personally have a credit card that I got when I was 18, I don't really use often but it mm -hmm. looks really good on my credit because it's just like a long standing relationship. So it mm -hmm. is important to kind of keep that in mind. Sometimes people don't realize that um, even if you're not using it, if, and sometimes the organization might close it for you, but they might also keep it just like, I have a Macy's account that I don't really use, but they'll keep it. And so you just see it as that like ongoing relationship with that place. But as mm -hmm. I said, educate yourself if there's, annual fees, any fees like that, sometimes places charge them, but if you can keep it without closing it, it can help your credit. So, Okay. And in order to build credit as well, that's something you're probably going to touch on too, because um, I'm not mm -hmm. sure, because it, it all sounds a bit kind of back to front to me, the way that it works, but it obviously does work. Um, but that's something I'd like to find out about is building credit too. Yeah, no, we will definitely talk about that. And again, um, I know it sounds daunting, but I I did a I actually did a session with um, a group of people who were living in Boston who were in just different stages of their life. And I had somebody who had literally didn't have a social security number and had never had a bank account. And so you can believe it or not, really start from scratch on building credit and things like that. And it does take some time, but the important thing is whatever, you know, start small, but always make sure you pay your bills on time and establish those little relationships. And mm -hmm. so, again, it can be anything. Like one of the things that a lot of people use to get started truly is, and it, Again, it can be anybody, but a lot of times if we're thinking about um, kids who might just be starting out with banking, things like that, like the cell phone, that might be the mm -hmm. first thing. But it's, you know, like a consistent payment. It's hopefully not that big, but it's something that you pay every month. And then as you make sure, as you continue to pay it, you're kind of building up your credit. So again, don't be daunted mm -hmm. because uh, everybody has to start somewhere. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of different ways to build it. But we will, yeah, we will talk more about that next week so I can give more specifics. But that's, yeah, that would I be would, great. Yeah. And, and the other yeah, thing, I think sure. the, the other thing was about finding out how to get your credit score without affecting your credit score. Um, and I, I don't know, like, is there, are there, well, I mean, you can talk about that next week, but that's just another thing that's just kind of mind boggling to me. I know. And it's also tough because there are organizations that say like they can help you get it for free, but then it's not really free. But as I mentioned earlier, legally, you are entitled to your credit report for free, which doesn't affect your credit score by you requesting your free credit report. So you can get one copy every year from the three reporting agencies, which is um, TransUnion, Experian, and I think the other one is now the one check system. But um, you definitely can get that, but I know it's hard because I've like seen the ads and there's the different places and they're like, oh, we can help you get it for free, but then they charge you for that service 
And so it is important to know that you should never be paying for it mm -hmm. because you can literally get it for free. But again, okay. I will have that. And I think <laughs> maybe what will be helpful is have the links available for everybody. Yeah. So maybe I'll make sure that next week, maybe we send out like a, a sheet, kind of like some of the resources. So people have that to know here are some of the websites that are helpful to go to because um, consumerfinance.gov has a lot of information, but there are a lot of really good websites. So I, I'll compile some things for that for next That's week because wonderful. I do think it's a valuable resource. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I know. Happy to okay, help. Okay, thank you. That's wonderful. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, um, well, um, if no one has any other questions, I will make sure that I'm going to send out, I know I referenced a couple of different um, worksheets here. There was a worksheet showing the, the, um, the way you can create your savings plan, the um, way you can track your expenses, talking about needs, wants, and um, obligations. And so I'll send out Again, I'll send out a sheet with resources. I can talk a little bit about where you, where you can find these because I do actually have downloadable examples for you guys. So I'll send that over and I'll make sure that um, we, we get that out to everybody. So yeah, I don't know you, if... Um, if you email Janet, them, that, yeah, and I have everyone's email address. So if you can get that to me, um, then I can pass that along. Yeah, I will, because um, they're downloadable from the FDIC. So I'll, I'll just provide the direct link. So then if you guys want to use any of those tables that I showed you, we can. Okay. Well, thank Oops. you so great. much, Abby. This is great, and I'm looking forward to next week. Yeah, no, and of course, tell anyone, if you have friends or, or people, if they're interested to, to also come, no obligation, but if they want to know more about credit, I know it can be confusing as I said, there's a lot of stuff out there, and I know I talked a little bit about advertisers and influence, influences, so um, just helpful to understand how to navigate it. So happy to help any way I can. Great, and if anyone has any questions or wants, or, um, wants to re-watch this, we're going to have this posted on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and search Nantucket F&M, um, this will come up. Hopefully, I'll get it up within a few days. Thank you. That's wonderful. Okay. Thanks.